Were you in Palestine right until the end? Yes, I tell you where we got as far as um, Damascus, you see, and that's where the Turks found that it was useless. And the promise had been made from the warlords that the Arab was, was to come in from Baghdad and seize Damascus, and uh, they, that was their payment for giving the secret information all the time to our army. See, we had several Australians on the uh, secret crowd. They used to ride behind the lines and all they dressed as Arabs. He was the key man, Lawrence mm. of Arabia. And the yeah. fellow I went to school with was his uh, pilot, his outsider, a fellow named Harper. I went to school with him. I can remember what the, the great general, the man that won the war there, of course. Allenby? Yes, of course. He was an old bugger, but he, he, he'd take me hat off to him. He won the war. Did he? He come and had a look we was doing no good. General Murray was living in Cairo and we were losing too many men and we wasn't strong enough to stop him. And he come and had a look and he dismounted about 1,500 yeomanry and gave their horses to the Camel Corps and gave the Camel Corps, which was Australian, uh, put them on to take food and weapons and that. And where there was one artillery piece, he put about 15 or 20. And then when he did hit, and it hit for about four days, that's when Beersheba fell. Now the other side of this story is that back in Damascus at that particular time, the uh, war correspondent, Massey, is talking to Lawrence. And Lawrence becomes enthusiastic at that particular interview and talks about the hopes, the aspirations of the Arabs for a united Arab nation and uh, becoming worked up about the thing. He said, why today, I'm not sure whether it was today or tomorrow, he said, the Arab flag will be flying on the town hall at Beirut. Now Massey, of course, knew all the orders concerning where troops could go and where they couldn't go. and in, also knew, of course, that uh, no flags would be flown anywhere. And so he listened while Lawrence told him of this uh, crowd that had gone through to Beirut. He didn't question the, uh, the rightness of this, as to whether it could be done, and the order that was being done against orders or anything like that. But immediately it was over, he realized that he ought to tell somebody in authority. Now, the general officer in Damascus at the time was uh, General Chevelle. And so Massey went along and told Chevelle everything that Lawrence had told him. Chevelle recognized that this thing was uh, even too hot for him to handle, and so he got in touch with Allenby. And Allenby came up the next day, flown up by Ross Smith in the big Handley Page plane which they were using. And the day after that, Lawrence left for Beirut, where he was picked up and taken to Alexander on a destroyer and picked up some materials that he had in Egypt and was on his way back to England. There it is. I don't know that anybody else could tell you that, that story. Fly? Yes, oh yes, the flag did fly. The flag did fly, but, but coming along the coast at that particular time, you see, we were ahead of the infantry. We got to Damascus before they were power with us on the coast. And coming along the coast at that time you know, were, were the infantry. When the infantry arrived in Beirut, of course, there was the Hedjo's flag flying on the town hall. But at any rate, as far as General Fane was concerned, he saw the Hedjo's flag flying on the Beirut town hall, and he gave them five minutes to pull it down or he'd shoot it down. Mm -hmm. So down it came. Me about Lawrence and what my opinion of Lawrence is, so many Australians seem to be very antagonistic. When they hear that uh, you had been there and you were in the troops that went into Damascus and so on, they, they do ask you, what's your opinion of Lawrence? Well, now, my opinion of Lawrence is based mainly on the, the opinion of the men who actually worked with him. The three men in the Arab Bureau who really had most to do with the troops in the field were Lawrence and Newcomb and Joyce. Now, Newcomb and Joyce were two regular soldiers, and uh, a war to them meant, of course, opportunities for promotion and honours and all the rest of it. But uh, I know from discussions with both Joyce and Newcomb how much they appreciated this man, Lawrence. At the particular time uh, when uh, the three of them were working together, 
There was the same price on their heads. As far as the Turks were concerned, the Turks, of course, were terribly keen to catch any one of the three. Now then, uh, both Joyce and Newcomb remained strong friends of Lawrence through all those times that came after Lawrence had really gone into what was just about oblivion. The, uh, you see, you can't get away from, you can't get away from this fact that these, these two men were men who would have appreciated a little bit more leadership being handed on to them, but they were quite prepared to serve with this young fellow, quite prepared to accept him as the leader. And uh, there it is. You can't get away from it. And not only that, when uh, Lawrence died, one of them was able to go to the funeral and act as a coffin bearer. These two men had the highest opinion of him, and you never heard any of the rubbish that uh, seemed to get into the newspapers and into magazines and so on concerning Lawrence. You never heard anything of that from them. They appreciated his real worth. I had heard a lot about Lawrence from Colonel Joyce who was one of the three Dad has already mentioned, the price, equal price on his head. And we had built Lawrence up into a most glamorous hero. And one of the biggest disappointments of my young life, perhaps young and romantic rather, was meeting Lawrence for the first time. He stood five feet four, looked a bit of a runt anyhow in those Bedouin clothes, had an insignificant appearance altogether and I was most bitterly disappointed by him. Nothing like the wonderful O'Toole creation in the picture. He came to the office of the uh, financial advisor to report or pay his compliments or whatever the occasion warranted, and uh, at the same time he was informed that there was this decoration from the king for him. And, uh, I went back and asked him if he would wait, that there was this talk of this decoration, they want to make arrangements. The next thing was Lawrence's back view tearing down the stairs off in a gary, you couldn't see him for dust. And that was the end of the decoration too, as far as the king was and concerned. And is this where he'd get the money from to pay the That's when Joyce used to get the money. No, the, the money actually came from the Arab Bureau. There were golden sovereigns from, from Australia. They're from Australia. Oh, yeah. Sent to the Arab Bureau, they collected it. Joyce, who stood six feet three, was extre an extremely handsome Irish, and young, of course, in those days. He used to come and collect the money. How, they, how the Turks never got, got him, I don't know, because he looked very, very English, mm. very blue eyes, and of course, his terrific height. And he used to collect the money and take it over to Lawrence, distribute it. And then one occasion arose when I was the only person who was notified that the girl was there sitting waiting. And it was a holiday and the Arab Bureau was closed. I got a bit frantic, wondering what was going to happen to these sovereigns. And they were at the Arab Bureau? No, no. they were at the, on the they ship were, waiting oh, to I be see. collected. Oh, okay. and the Arab Bureau was closed. I was the one, in, in the, being in the office I was, who was notified. Nobody to go and collect it. However, arrangements were duly made to collect them and put them in the bank until Joyce came over. He did a great, he did a great job there, Lawrence of Arabia. I didn't beat him, but he was. He worked in with us on one stunt when we went out. We were going out, riding out on some stunt or other to attack some place, and there was a little lot of Arabs mounted on very good camels about 50 yards away on our right, and they said, oh, that's Lawrence of Arabia with some of the, some of the sheiks and some of their men going out, coming out to help us on this stunt. So he travelled along parallel with us for about 50 yards. And uh, that was the only time I saw him, but he was there. He consolidated all the tribes, or a lot of them. They say he blew up 79 bridges and railways, I don't know.
But that's what he used to do, go and blow up the railway and then when the Turks, a train full of Turkish soldiers, he, they'd blow it up and then they'd open fire on the Turks and then when the Turks came, became consolidated and, and started after them, they just retire, get on their camels and clear out. Yeah. And, and then they do it, sort of uh, guerrilla warfare, yeah. hit and run. Yeah.